Okay, time is upon us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome this morning. Thank you for being here. It's good to have, always good to have nice crowds for uh, Rector's Forum. Today we're going to be looking at the mainline decline. Yes, that is all one word. Um, it, and just to preface this, I, I'm not sure, you've been through this with the separation with the Episcopal Church, um, but just by way of just a local frame of reference, I'm not sure if you're aware, just down the road here from us, our friends at the Methodist Church, they are actually going through now what we went through a decade ago or a decade or more ago. Uh, and my understanding is that the, that the church there has voted to stay with the United Methodist Church, which is the more progressive faction, and that folks now are, are leaving there. Either some have come here and will warmly receive them and offer ministry and offer them participate in ministry. Others, I think, are seeing about starting a, um, uh, what's it called, Global Methodist Church. That's kind of like their version of ACNA. So it's, it's all very interesting that these things are happening now at this time. But I do want us to start us off with prayer. This is a prayer from our Book of Common Prayer. So the Lord be with you. Together let us pray. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, to start off the idea or to the dialogue on the mainline decline, you have to understand what is the main line. Um, anybody want to take a guess or a stab? Why, we, why do we call a group of churches mainline churches? They were originally on Main Street. They were originally on Main Street. You're getting close to it, actually. You're getting... <laughs> In the 1920s, people traveling by train through Philadelphia noticed that as the Pennsylvania Railroad main line left the city center and traveled north, it passed by local churches representing just about every main denomination in Protestantism. And so these churches became known as the main line churches because they were situated on the main line of this railroad route. If, for those of you who know um, um, Philadelphia, it's now Amtrak's uh, Keystone Corridor. It's, it's there on the north end there. So yes, somebody knows, yes. You know, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this actually, this idea of the mainline church, the idea of it and the definition of it to describe it was actually changed a little bit later. It was called the Seven Sisters. Um, and that came to describe just the same thing. It narrowed down to those denominations that fell under this umbrella of Protestantism. So they were basically the seven largest Protestant churches. And those were at the time the United Methodist Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church USA, American Baptist Church, which are different from Southern Baptists, United Church of Christ, and then the uh, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. So those were the, those were the seven churches that make up the um, that make up mainline churches, the, the Seven Sisters. And you'll notice, and if you hasn't come to mind, you'll see in just a minute, what do all of those seven churches have in common, statistically? Just nose diving. They're nose diving. And part, part of what I want us to look at this morning is why we think this might be happening, or what can we take away from what's happening to these churches? Starting off with just the Episcopal Church, I won't do this for all of them, but for our sake, I will. Um, this shows us the decline from 1970 to 2018. It's now below one and a half million. Um, and back in the heyday, 1970, it was just under three and a half million Episcopalians uh, on, on the books back then. Now, church decline has gone down. Church, I mean, church attendance overall has gone down during this period. However, but what has population done? It's increased stratospherically. And so that's a contextual reality we have to deal with here is that the overall, within the Episcopal Church, uh, overall attendance, people who, who identify as Episcopalians, it's shot down. In fact, so much so that at the end of 2022, so we're coming out of COVID now at the, at the end of 2022, we're pretty much, if you want to be at church, you can be at church. The average Sunday attendance the Episcopal Church uh, in 2022 was just a little over 370,000 on a Sunday. 
which us with being in the ACNA, we are very nascent. Um, and yet we're, we're about a third of that already. So we, now many of us came out of the Episcopal Church. I did not, I came out of uh, confessional Lutheranism, but we continue to grow. One of, the, one of the statistics that the Pew Research Group had done was they went to look at church attendance post COVID and certain, certain groups did grow. The ACNA, we are one of them that grew. So yay, you know, it's like we came back and people started coming back to church. I think part, there's a lot of reasons for that. I do think, um, and you'll see some of the political affiliations here. I do think part of that was we were, once all the information was out and we as leaders in ACNA said, it's your decision whether or not you want to come to church, but we are going to offer church. And so because of that, we were kind of out, the ACNA as a church body within America, we were kind of on the forefront of that. And so, because, so our numbers went up for it because if you're a Methodist or a Lutheran or even Missouri Synod conservative Lutheran and you can't go or you have to worship in a way that you find uncomfortable, well, you hear about ACNA, it's like, who are those crazy people with no masks on? Um, you know, th there's an opportunity for worship there. So this actually will give you the overall. So this is from 19, but this is only from 1990 until our present date. Um, and it shows the overall population is actually, and the overall population is of church attenders, not of the country. So the overall population of church attenders in the last 30 years has declined. Um, there is some, even AOG, the Assembly of God, the largest growing group of Christians in the world right now, the first is our Pentecostals. And there is no one Pentecostal church, so they're a little bit more difficult to measure. Uh, but here in America, they're actually declining somewhat. Uh, another, the other group of the fastest growing uh, group of Christians in the world are Anglicans worldwide. Now, this is just in the USA, but worldwide, why do you think that is? Africa, Africa, Africa. we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but Africa. Um, we sent missionaries there during colonialization. They have their own bishops now. Now they're sending people back here to evangelize us. Um, which I think is great. I, I, we need it. Um, but it shows you that there's a clear decline. Some suffer worse than others. Clearly, the, uh, the, the Episcopal Church and the United Methodist Church have, have taken a, a pretty steady trajectory south. Even the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant body in the world, they are they're going downhill. Yes? What is ABC USA? Okay, so a, that's the American Baptist Church, United States of America. So they're more of a, they are the longest Baptist body in America. Again, they're different from the Southern Baptist Church. They tend to be a bit more progressive. AOG is Assembly of God. ELC is every little church in America. No, that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. <laughs> that's what, like as conservative Lutherans, that's what we call them. It's kind of little. PCUSA is Presbyterian Church USA. We have one down the road here, and they have taken, they are still part of the Presbyterian Church USA, but I've been told they're very orthodox so much so that they've taken the PCUSA signs off the building. The reason for that is, now this is my guess, they probably don't want to deal with a property fight right now. They're just like, we will stay here, we'll be faithful, just leave us alone. If, for those of you who ever spent any time in uh, Virginia Beach, Galilee Church is doing the same thing. If you've ever seen Galilee Church in Virginia Beach, they are still an Episcopal parish. There's nothing on anything they have that says they're Episcopal though, because they don't want to have a, a property fight. So they're just kind of putting their head down and rowing for Jesus. Uh, SBC is Southern Baptist Convention. Tech is the Episcopal Church. UCC is the United Church of Christ. And UMC is the United Methodist Church. That brings us through 2020. Actually, some of these, and the Methodist Church is just dropping off even more rapidly because of the split they're going through. Um, the Episcopal Church as well. The, in the last four years, the ELCA, the, Luth the Liberal Lutheran Church, they're nosediving. I often make jokes among clergy that like, sometimes I think that the ELCA is trying to out crazy the Episcopal Church. Like, let's see who can do the craziest thing. Uh, and you'll see some of this in, but the irony is what they all have in common other than the American Baptist Church USA is, is clearly decline. And the American Baptist Church is somewhat liberal. It's, it's slightly progressive, um, but it's, not, not like these other groups, I'll put it that way. You would see a greater contrast with these other groups. 
Mormon church, it, you know, I don't know, that's a good question because I used to track that. Um, I've not looked at it recently. They had plateaued somewhat in the, around 2010. I don't know what they've done since then, but the, when I say plateaued, though, they were actually, they were holding steady, you know. At some point in time, every, I don't like to con compare a, the church to a business, but every now and then a business gets where, okay, this is what we can do in the world. And I think that they had a sense of that. Uh, but, but to their credit, Sandra, that's a good question because part of the decline in this is, is we have to own our own business, is why are our children not going to church? You know, why are children, grandchildren? And there's, a, there's a Christian Smith. Christian Smith, he's at a U.S. See Chapel Hill, and what he has done, and he's got to be hitting almost 30 years now, he takes a cohort of young people, and while they're in high school, he identifies them, and for the rest of their life, at least now about 30 years in, he does a new group every year, and he follows their religious trends, who goes back, who stays in church, and who doesn't, and he is just a massive, he has just massive amounts of data, he's very interesting, he started out as an evangelical, became Episcopalian because he liked the liturgy, then got frustrated, well, as some people here did, now he's Roman Catholic. Um, but to your question, though, the groups that he, whose children are most likely to still be in church, Missouri Synod Lutherans, Presbyterian Church America, and Mormons, what do they all have in common? Catechesis, strong catechesis. So his data says, if you catechize our children, they're more likely to stay in. Um, so it's a great question, yeah. And so tr that's, why, that's why when Patrick talks about catechesis and when we throw it into the, the uh, discovery class, it's like, this stuff is really important. Um, and Luther did a great job, I don't want to tangent, but Luther did a great job because he made a, cate a shorter catechism for homes. And the idea was you would do it, parents would do it with their children. I, lo I love our, um, to be a Christian, our Anglican catechism, but it's over 350 questions where Luther just takes the Lord's Prayer, um, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and what was the other one? The Creed, the, the Creed. And you, you know, there are three things that you use almost every church service, and he breaks it down and asks simple questions about them. And so because of that, it was, it's, very, it's a lot easier for people to keep their faith in difficult situations, because if you're catechized, you have a body of knowledge to draw on. Okay, so I'm gonna do the elephant in the room, political ideology based on, on groups. And I, the reason I bring this out is it points to a fact and it also points to a danger. Um, a fact that oftentimes our, church become our churches become politically polarized, and that is a danger. We, sh we as a church, if somebody, has a, if somebody has a position and we say, yes, that's in line with the gospel and we agree with you with, on that, we should say that. But we can't say, as a whole, the church put our arms around any person or or our body and say, yes, that's us. Because we know that that's not the church. It's, I don't, it, it could be the most wonderful leader, the most wonderful party, and still that's not the case because political parties are not the church. However, here in the West, it, it, you, would think that we, you would think that political parties are the church. I'll give you, a, on Time Magazine in 1952, I think it was, it described the Episcopal Church as the Republican Party at prayer. So yes, how things have changed. So um, the top shows you all church go goers where they identify politically. This will factor into the decline. A um, little under half are conservative, which means conservative, again, now this, don't hear politically. That doesn't mean Republican. Conservative means, particularly within the sense of the church, we have a set of beliefs and we don't want to lose them. We have a set of beliefs, and we don't want to lose these beliefs. We have basic foundational beliefs. That's part of the, the difficulty here, with, because as soon as I say conservative and liberal, within the church, people think parties, don't think parties. Um, think of conservative as people who want to keep their beliefs liberal, meaning I'm willing to change my beliefs based on external stimuli. So um, culture influences me. As a if I were a very liberal person, I would say, then I will react with culture and I will take on culture. Um, so for white mainline Protestant churchgoers, they're in the majority, they're conservative, but there's a third are liberal. Um, the clergy, as you can see, within the mainline church, where are the clergy? Liberal. Really liberal, really liberal. And so that 
is that does explain some of the changes we've had in the, in the decline in mainline church when p- the people at the top are, ha- do not maintain the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as St. Jude says. If you let that go, now the people are fighting against the clergy trying to maintain, trying to maintain their church. You also see this in academia, I can tell you. You see it in academia. Uh, I, in 2014, I completed a master's a postgraduate master's of theology at Duke University. And at the time, I thought, well, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of everybody there, but overwhelmingly, it's like, it, it's a very orthodox school. In fact, we had a friend of ours who was a physician and ethicist. He was at the University, University of Chicago in 2000, far Curlin. In 2014, he came to Duke and said, it's one of the last places an academic can still be a Christian. In talking with his brother, he said, I don't think it's the case anymore at Duke that it's, going to be, it's, it's hard to be an outspoken Christian there. And that's, and that's difficult. So now you've got the academia and you have the leadership of our churches, our clergy, who are, very, who are more likely to take on what culture is putting out. Again, the American Baptists are, are a bit more conservative. Um, you can see Episcopal churches all the way down, particularly their clergy, you know, 70%. I, I did have, I always found it interesting Talking with other, talking with Episcopalians, because I mean, I can have, I can, and I always want to have a dialogue with anybody, particularly people I disagree with, uh, not to convince them, but also I do want. I, I think it's important to at least be able to be a gentleman and be in conversation with those we disagree with, or, or a lady, whatever the case is. Um, and I can remember having a discussion with a an Episcopal priest, who said, "Well, Kelly, I personally am conservative. In my home, we're conservative." but I want to allow everybody room to be where they're at. I'm like, that's, you know, and, and that's, that is, there's a term for that. It's the soft tyranny of low expectations. The soft tyranny of low expectations, meaning God has given us a standard here, and I can't expect you to try and live up to that. It's a form of tyranny because you have the truth, and, and we're all going to fail. As you, for those of you who are in the early service, we will all sin. And if you go in the next service, you'll hear it too. We all sin, um, but we also want to try and pull each other up in our sanctification and in our life together. So, the, so looking forward to the future, um, this tells you where we are in terms of optimism. It's interesting, the bottom two churches have the highest optimism. They are at the same time the most liberal and they have the most decline. We have a phrase for that. It's called whistling past the graveyard. <laughs> it's we are headed in steady decline. Our leadership is pushing us and forcing us into decline. There's people down below saying, no, I want to be a faithful Christian, as Christians have been throughout the ages. And then the leadership saying, don't worry about it. It's all going to be wonderful in the end. That's, so that, that's what's going on there. Um, the, only, the only people who are, but at the same time, the ones who are the most optimistic, the ones who score the highest on very optimistic, are the churchgoers, are the, ch- are the, are the folks like yourselves, the people in the pews every Sunday uh, who, are, who are determined to outlast this wave. I, I have a great corollary to this. So um, when I got to the Special Forces School, I was made dean of a department and um, of regional and cultural studies, and I was making a lot of changes. And I know I'm only there for three years, so I gotta get my changes in quick. Um, and I can remember talking to the, to the government workers, the civilian workers. Some of them have been there 20, 25 years. And they'd be like, okay, Kelly, you do your change. You, you do that. We'll see how much you get done. They were like the people in the pews. They were saying, we'll see how much you get done, but we have a long game. And if we don't like your change, we're not going to do it. <laughs> and I realized that early on. It's like, okay, I've got to work with these folks. Um, yeah, so it, you know, that can be the congregation saying to the people, saying to the, somebody, if if they're preaching heresy or heterodoxy, look at it and say, well, you think that's going to happen. I don't believe that. And my family doesn't believe that. We're not going to allow that in my house. And we won't be going out to dinner with you anymore. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, how satisfied are folks with their leadership? Um, it's interesting because this was, this was two years ago. Already the meth- the, our Methodist friends were already seeing the writing of the wall and getting very frustrated with leaders who are trying to take them in a direction away from the gospel. 
Um, for the rest of us, like the Episcopal Church there, the divorce is over, there's the Episcopal Church, and now there's ACNA. Um, so those who are now Episcopal want to be there. That's why they, 94%, are proud to say they're part of that church, because they didn't go ACNA, you know? Um, so that's their situation. It's interesting, the ones who are, the ones that are least proud to say they're part of that church is the American Baptist, which among the seven mainline churches is the most conservative one, however you want to look at it. So it's very interested. And who's, other than the Methodist church, the people who are at least satisfied with their leadership, the Baptists and all clergy. <laughs> and I understand that with all clergy not being happy because as a company grade officer in the military, oh, those people up at brigade. And once you move up to brigade, it's, oh, those people at division, they don't know what's going on at division. It's all core. I hate those guys in core. So I think there's a natural effect of that in leadership. We always think the next level up is, is a source of all of our problems. So that brings us to our problem here is the disappearance of denominations. Um, I think that goes to 2023, how much they declined since their height. So that would be like, the, all the way at the bottom there, almost 50%, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Since their zenith, their highest point, that's how much they've declined. They've lost half their people. So first, the mainline church, despite its emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion, has been spectacularly unsuccessful in appealing to minorities of all people. Very few minorities in those groups. The gospel of diversity does not bring various peoples together nearly as well as the gospel of the cross. So for... We came into an ACNA church, Truro, in the D.C. area. Some of you might know it's kind of, kind of a sister church to the Falls Church in D.C. We were as ethnically diverse as you could be. Now, here we, we represent the island, which is what you would expect. We look like our island. You should look like what's around you. But I can also say in the D.C. area, there are a lot of churches who are monolithic. <laughs> they look like one person. The, the parish we were in, ACNA parish, we had Anglicans from all over the world and you'll see in a little bit, you are part of, I would say, the groups of Christians with the most ethnic natural diversity are Roman Catholics and Anglicans, hands down. You'll see why in a bit. Um, second, theological liberalism is by definition supposed to be attuned to the times in which we live today. So if you're more liberal, I'm not saying that makes that person a Democrat or whatever. I'm saying a theological liberal means I'm very in tune to what's going on in the world, and I'm incorporating it into my ministry. The making of American liberal theology since the 18th century, one writer puts, liberal Christian thinkers have argued that religion should be modern and progressive and that the meaning of Christianity should be interpreted from the standpoint of modern knowledge and experience. In other words, if any ecclesiastical tradition, that's a church body or denomination, if any of them should be relevant for the people today, you would think it would be the mainline ones. I mean, because they're the ones absorbing the most of what's going on in culture and incorporating it. We'll look at, we'll look at how that has an expression in a little bit, but these are the de denominations who are taking on the culture and then diffusing it out and saying, we're just like you, culture. Why don't you like us? Um, so look at it this way. The more church mimics progressive and popular culture, clearly, the more it declines. And, you know, there, there's that phrase in statistics in sociology, that correlation is not causality, meaning this happened and there's, we see this effect over here, but it's very difficult to say maybe that's that one thing. However, when all of them are declining at this rate, we can clearly say that causality is progressivism. It's, that's what has happened to these churches in their decline. Are conservative churches declining? Some of them, however, not nearly at this stratospheric pace, just not even close. Southern Baptist Church, yes, it's going down some, uh, but nothing like this. I mean, they, the Southern Baptist Church has some of the most decline within, I would say, evangelicalism. These churches would love to have the pace of decline of the Southern Baptist Church because it would be an improvement. Um, and that's the rub. Relevant Christianity doesn't stay relevant for very long. I mean, as soon as you realize, as, think of it this way, as soon as your church body realizes, well, this is the new relevant thing. The new relevant thing is to jump into, and I'll just bring out the hot topics because they are the world we live in. Black, we'll say Black Lives Matter. I'll just pick one that came to mind. We're going to jump all over that. Well, by the time the church comes in, understands it, incorporates it, diffuses it to its people, a lot of times it's no longer even that popular anymore. 
that's the reality of the situation. You know, there's a lot of people now backing up. Look at, well, Black Lives Matter just went bankrupt. Why? Because they didn't want people to see their spending. Well, that doesn't look so good now to have the sign out front of your church. Um, and I do believe Black Lives Matter, by the way. That's the rub. It doesn't stay relevant for long. Um, reinterpreted Christianity may appeal to deconstructing, but it doesn't win hearts and minds of the lost. So after almost 60 years of constant mainline decline, we have a pretty good idea why it happened. Basically, the church has, has this wonderful inheritance of faith from God through Jesus Christ and the apostles. We have this wonderful deposit of faith given to us to pass on to generation to generation for the salvation of souls, the renewal of lives and families in the church, and it's been found unimportant. So, what does this look like? Well, as some of you have had classes with me before, I'm a visual person. I like signs, I like art, I also like music, but I want to show you church signs that will help explain this. And if you have any questions or experiences you want to share in this process, please do so. The first one is for a United Methodist Church. <laughs> so let's just break this apart quickly. Jesus has two dads. What do they mean by that? God the Father and Joseph, his, his stepfather, his caretaker. And he turned out okay. What are they trying to reference there? Gay marriage. They're saying same-sex marriage is okay because, look, Jesus had two dads. Now, it might be catty, and it might sound like in a mathematical equation, that's right, but did Jesus have two dads who were married together that raised him? No, but that's what they're trying to say there. Is... Yeah, he didn't turn out just okay. Yeah, he turned out a lot better than okay. He, he led the world's most effective rebellion. It's very interesting, a special forces team is 12 guys, and you basically throw them out of an airplane in the middle of nowhere, do clandestine operations, don't get caught, and come home. There are, Jesus had his 12 disciples. I, a good friend of mine, we kept saying, someday we need to look at Jesus' life and look at what we do here and show that Jesus was really actually the world's most effective and successful uh, revolutionary. Not in the Marxist sense, but in a good positive sense. By far the world's most effective revolutionary. Here's another one. This is the United Church of Christ. <laughs> I know it's ruffling feathers. I, I, see, I see feathers flying. Okay, so let's talk about the first, the first statement is the idea that God loves people. We all, we, he loves us enough to die for us. Who's going to argue with that? Not me. God loves you just the way you were made. Let's start with that. If God le loves you just the way with your, you're made, is, does that mean he's going to leave you like that? I mean, Scripture is clear. We're, we're all born in rebellion to God. That's why we baptize babies. Some people have their babies like, oh, look how perfect they are. It's like, yes, and just wait till they get legs and language. You know? <laughs> that will change. You will see what they really are. So... God just doesn't love you to leave you and just feel good about yourself. But what was the other part? She. Yeah. So do I think that God is a man with a physical body like a man? In one sense, yes. One sense, no. In one sense, yes, Jesus has a resurrected body that is male. God the Father, does he have a body? It's, it's interesting to look at uh, medieval art because oftentimes God doesn't have completely a body. He has a backside that's kind of like a cloud. It's a reference uh, it's a reference to Elijah, but then he has a white beard and looks like Santa Claus in the front. You know, that's not what God is like. God is pure spirit, but he acts towards us as a father, and that's how we understand him. That changes things as, as soon as you start calling God she. The very concept of God is being deconstructed. And at the end of this, my answer to him is, well, why would I ever go to church if God loves me just the way she made me. I don't need to change. I don't need any new information. I don't need anything revealed to me. I might as well just stay home and watch football. After all, I do like the Steelers, you know? <laughs> or, yeah, I, and I like the Pirates as much as they stink. I should use a different word, but, you know, I could just stay home and watch baseball. Uh, this is an ELCA. <laughs> yes. 
they, them, creator, he, him, son, she, her, holy spirit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know, that, like, some of the letters, yeah. Yeah, it ran out of H's, yeah. And then, but what else do you notice there? It's, that captures your eyes so much, but what else do you notice that's put on there? The rainbow. Who do you think they might be appealing to here? <laughs> the no, not the Noahic Covenant, no. <laughs> I think, as I analyze this, I think they're trying really hard to appeal to younger people. Um, to say that we are just like you, we understand you and your pronouns. Um, my pronouns are cool and awesome, um, but I know those aren't pronouns. Um, yeah, but this is, this is trying to reach out to young people and say, we understand you, which, is, which we'll see why this is uh, as we carry along here. Yeah. That is, these are, as we go into, and I'm picking one from each mainline church, by the way. I'm making sure everybody's represented. This is where the political has completely overthrown the theological. This is the way it looks like. And, and by the way, you can fall off on both sides of the horse. You can fall off on the left side or the right side on this. So, this is where you, because you could, you could change that around. God prefers kind, kind Christians over hateful atheists, you know. You can, however you want to move, move this around, you can. But particularly the Peace USA has gone very, very liberal of late. Um, and so what, what does that say? So think of it this way. God prefers kind atheists. God prefers nice people who don't believe in him over Christians who behave badly, and they will till the day we die. Simul justus et peccator. We are at the same time sinner and saint. Um, but he prefers them over those whose blood is applied to and who he's redeemed. That doesn't make sense. Now, we come from a tradition of Christianity that does believe, well, I'll put it this way. Anglicanism is so big, we have people who are Arminian and Calvinist within the camp. It's that big. As long as you stay within the, the, within the circle of orthodoxy, we're okay. Um, but we're saying that those whom God has, has pulled out and, and brought to eternal life and, and predestined toward salvation that he likes mean people who hate him more than those he's working with and trying to mold into his, the image of his son. It's very snowy there if you can't see in the background. Yeah. And this is a church, and the word justice, justice in Latin, that word means setting things to right. A church sets things to right by killing us in baptism and raising us to new life in Jesus, and by feeding us with the body and blood of Christ and his word every Sunday. That's how we are justified. They're, playing, they're making jokes about the weather, but again, what do you see up there at the very top of that sign? A rainbow flag. They're not talking about justice like Paul or Jesus or the Old Testament prophets are talking about justice. They're talking about an altogether different justice. Yeah. yeah. This one is somewhat more subtle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no Christian flag. It's, it's interesting, J.D. and I have discussed about, you know, the use of the American flag in in parishes and there's really two two philosophies to it one is you want it in the sanctuary so we're reminded to pray for a country the other is you want it out in the courtyard so can people can see that those people there they're good patriotic christians or some people say both um but this flag is not what we're talking about you know it just makes it very very clear and by the way the first the disciples of christ is one with the most decline and now the episcopal church I agree with that statement as data on paper. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be Patrick's truck, yeah. <laughs> hey, those, those do look like your tires, Patrick. I think you have some explaining to do. Um, I believe with all my heart that the church should be a place where there are no outcasts, where everyone should be welcomed in and hear the gospel and have the opportunity for the word of God to renew them. I believe that 
wholeheartedly. But clearly, that doesn't mean no outcasts. That is a statement of universalism that we believe that everybody's saved and that there is no distinction between heaven and hell and just come inside and, I guess, do nothing. I don't know, you know? Sing of a tradition you don't believe in. Here's scriptures that you want to reinterpret. And I don't mean that unkind. That's just the frustration of it all. So, and this is where I want us to finish up today. Um, yeah, okay, good, you can see that. So Carl Truman first wrote his first book, on this topic, on how we got here. And this one, we have it in the bookstore you can buy. The one he wrote about how we got here, people found very, very difficult. It's very scholarly work, but very difficult. So he, he actually wrote a paper book, cloth cover one, that just brings it down to the average person. Uh, because Truman is, is a very, very deep thinker. He was one of the first speakers we had on Friday at Mere Anglicanism, and he was great. He was whimsical, he was a gentleman, he was wonderful. But he, he says there are nine ways this has happened, and I'll just boil it down to you so you don't have to read it, or I might pick your interest to read it. The first is, welcome to the strange new world. Expressive individualism, meaning I should be able to say that I am whatever I am without any judgment, that that has now met the sexual revolution. That... Uh, he opens up his book by saying, if I would, Truman does, he said, if I would have told my grandfather in 60 years, a man can be a woman, a woman could be a man, my grandfather would have, would have hit me across the head, well, you're crazy, son, you're crazy, what's, going, what's wrong with you? That's what he means by welcome to this strange new world. People can declare to be whatever they want to be, which we always told our kids growing up anyway, it's like, that's not really true. Not everybody could be an astronaut. Um, but the sexual revolution is latched on to that. The next thing is the romantic roots, that our history and our traditions are ir irrelevant. History and tradition are irrelevant. Our inner instincts rule. Me feeling my feels and following my feels, my feelings, that's what I ought to do. That goes all the way back to Rousseau. Then Prometheus Unbound. Um, if, if Prometheus is with the Greek gods in mythology, and Prometheus gives humanity fire and wisdom, and the gods didn't want them to have, because said, if humans get fire and wisdom, no telling what they'll do to the world. And so that's why he calls it Prometheus Unbound. Social organizations, they make the argument, and the gods are like, we can't let people have this because they'll destroy the world. Their argument from Prometheus is the social organizations, churches, the government, things like that. The, the, the attitude is from Marx, Nietzsche, and Oscar Wilde that you, you people couldn't handle being in charge. We need, we need that you don't have any say in anything. And the argument against that is we will create our new social organizations. So, for example, there was a church of atheists in England. It was the Atheist Church. Go figure, it didn't last very long, it didn't. But they thought they would sing their songs and talk about their lives. That's how this comes out. Um, the, the next thing is sexualizing psychology and politicizing sex. In that, sex becomes the primary factor in identity. Identity is politics, and with Freud, politics are power. So no longer, we used to, social science says ethnicity is a choice. And so I could say, well, I'm from Iowa. It's my ethnicity. I'm a Midwesterner. I'm Irish. I'm a military veteran. I'm an Anglican. I'm a Caucasian. I could pick any one of those, uh, and that would be fine. But now the thing is, no, no, no. The only two identities that matter are race and sex. So, and race, you don't get to choose. Darn it, so how do you get any power in this new system? Well, it's by saying, declaring what my sex is in contraindication to who I am. Think, you may have seen the uh, National Institute of Health in England said no more sex changes for minors. The reason why, particularly among young girls, it's gone up like 300% three, or something like that within the last few years of young girls wanting to change their sex. Because if you're a young woman, first, I admit that there's a struggle within because men are the stronger sex. You always have that. It's part of the fall. Welcome to falling humanity. You have that tension between men and women. 
Um, so you have that as a woman, and you're trying to aspire in life. And if you're not one of the chosen minority races, you don't have a sort of advantage there. But what if I am a man? Well, that changes everything. That gives you power. It gives you authority and things of that nature. I'm not agreeing with this. This is what I don't agree with at all. This is what Truman is saying. This is what has happened to our churches. And then the revolt of the masses. Traditional sources of identity and family are internal, not external. Um, these sources of identity, it used to be your family. It used to be your church. No, it's not. It's your insides. What you are feeling in your insides is who you really, who, not who you really are. It's that, but it's also what you really are. Um, people, pla plastic people, liquid world, old identities are now implausible. So this takes place over a timeline. Um, and the, with the need to belong. So those old identities, uh, church, family, um, social organizations, all those things are no longer mean anything. Your identity inside you means something. But now, if it's your internal, if it's the internal you is what you are, how do you belong to a group? Because the way I feel, if, if I'm trusting that I am not what my body says I am. Well, the church says that's wrong. And my parents, my family might be at odds at me if I'm that young person. So where do I go? Well, we create new societies of cohorts of people who encourage this in one another. Next is the sexual revolution of LGBT+. Now your primary identity in life is your sexuality, your sexual preference. That is your new primary identity identity, and to deny anybody that is to oppress them and make them a victim. So now it went from being, I just want to be accepted for what I am, now to you have to affirm what I am or you've committed a crime. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are self-creators and we cannot be judged. Whatever we create ourselves to be, you cannot judge me for it, is what this says. And you'll see it England's been hit very hard with this in, in making bad decisions. Now, if you say something to somebody in public or even personally, that's a crime. If you say, I do not think, young man who's dressed like a woman, I do not think you're a woman, and I, I, there's a better way. You, what you're looking for, you're not going to find in that. I can go to jail for that and be fined. And the last is strangers in this strange new world. So, that so one through eight, he's talking about how we got to the problem. Chapter 9, he tries to tell us, okay, for those of us who are, want to be faithful to the church and to God, what do we do? First is realism. We have to admit, in some part, the church hasn't spoken up, or we've, or we've been quiet too long. It's not to, be, not to bash people, it's to do what the church has always done, with compassion, share the gospel, and allow the word of God to judge people and then hopes that they'll feel the conviction of the law and turn to Christ. And the other half of that is a Benedict option. For those, so those of you might be, some of you might be familiar with Rod Dreher and the Benedict option. It's this. It's what many of us are already doing. Well, the Benedict option is to pull back from society some, to encourage one another as Christians, and then to go back out into society, influence it, and then hurry back up and recoup because you're going to need it. That's why so many families are homeschooling is because it's that opportunity, that Benedict option to bring their children up in the faith, catechize them, as we mentioned earlier, so that they'll be in the faith when we're done. So I, I say this to say, we, like folks within the ACNA, like the growing global Methodist church and others, we are now, whether you like it or not, we're the resistance. We are the resistance to popular culture. I mentioned this in a sermon before, I just wanted to share it again, Nick Cave, punk rocker from, us, from New Zealand, one of my favorite guys. He is writing some of the most inspirational stuff right now, and he's very edgy. It's, it's wonderful stuff. P Freddie Sayers is interviewing, saying, are you just writing this God stuff into your songs just to mess with people? And then, so Nick Cave responds, says, you be a conservative, and people start laughing at him. The guy asks him, is that today's equi equivalent? He's like, yeah, you go to church and be a conservative. <laughs> That is what it means to be a rebel today. So I'll finish off with this, and then perfect timing. I'll finish off with this. Just keep this in mind. 
First century Christians were not thrown to the lions because they held Tuesday night Bible studies. They were martyred because they resisted the, the claim that Caesar was Lord. Caesar, the elements within the state, also Satan himself, these, the world, the flesh, the devil are, de are declaring themselves as Lord. And it's very prominent in our world right now. We are the ones now who have to stand up and say, no, Jesus is Lord. All right, I, gotta, I have to get ready.